I am wondering or wanting guidance on, um, you talk about not feathering a child's nest. And my husband and I talk about that a lot because, you know, we're trying to figure out how to handle things. And I realized today that we do come from an action-oriented point of view, like how should we handle this, opposed to maybe lining up our energy. But we struggle with um, not feathering his nest, but then not being too harsh, and I end up waffling. Well, here, we can make this very simple and easy for you. (coughs) When we say we are not keen on feathering someone's nest, here's what we literally mean by that. Well, here's what we don't mean. We don't mean give your child a hard life so that your child figures out how to compensate for a hard life. We don't mean that at all. If we were standing in your physical shoes, we would provide the same lifestyle for our child that we had learned to achieve for ourselves. In other words, we wouldn't get your child to start over or even try to replicate your own childhood because this God, energy, no. <laughs> this, this energy came forth into the expectation of what you now are. And so we would just proceed with our life as usual. By not feathering the nest, what we mean is we would not see ourselves as the compensator or the fixer of everything about this child's life. We would see the child as the creator of his own experience. And as the child relates to your experience, then certainly there is creation that you will want to offer. You want to offer a roof, and you want to offer a lifestyle, and you want Mm -hmm. to offer food, and you want to offer an example of a joyous life experience. But you don't want to get into the middle of everything that the child is creating and try to make their creation your creation. Mm -hmm. That's really what we are meaning about that. And if you don't lose sight of what's most important, in other words, here's the orientation that is most important. Your dominant intention with your child is to remind the child that you have remembered. And we use those words very specifically because the child has not yet forgotten this. So if you remind yourself and then remind the child that you have now remembered that the most important thing is joy, In other Mm -hmm. words, that's the symbol of a successful life that you are reaching for. Then you'll never get out of balance with this child. Well, and part of joy is comfort, and I guess I'm comfortable when I'm joyful. And I think that's where I really struggle is seeing that maybe he's uncomfortable, but for me to make him comfortable makes me uncomfortable. Do you want me to give you an example? Yes. Um, He is over a year now and he used to sleep through the night and now he's waking up and I have started co-sleeping with him because I thought it would be easier when he started waking up to to nurse him back to sleep. Well, now I feel like there's a dependency and there's a part of me that wants to say um, he can figure out how to get himself back to sleep and rely on himself. All right, now here's how you know the distinction. When you decide to be selfishly oriented, which you naturally are and which we really encourage, and you encourage your child to be the same, but when it reaches the place where his comfort becomes a sacrifice of your comfort, now things are out of balance. And as you teach him that you're willing to sacrifice your comfort in order to provide his, that's what we mean. That's, in fact, that's the quintessential meaning, what we mean when we say feather the nest. And so it may very well reach the place. In other words, the path of least resistance for you for a while was to just bring him to bed with you. And that seemed like the logical thing to do. And therefore it was the logical thing to do. But now as he gets older and as you realize that your own sleep patterns are being disrupted, now this contrasting experience is making you desire something different. So now where your struggle comes in is you're saying, you're literally asking, well, whose desire should I satisfy? My desire or his desire? And the answer is always your desire. And this is when you say, I'm going to satisfy my desire and you must find a way to satisfy by your desire. That makes it clear, doesn't it? In other words, (laughs) there's no risk for your child. In other words, you're not depriving your child of anything that 
your child needs. And so now you are selfishly doing what is best for you, and that is the best thing that you can teach the child. You say, no, this is what I am now wanting, and this is what I'm going to achieve. Now you can be joyful about that, or you can be happy about that, but I am now not going to modify my behavior in order to adjust the way you feel about it. So am I not sending that clear message to him, do you think? Well, we think that you are. And so your question is, why can I not send it energetically? And my child who supposedly is tuned in, tapped in, turned on will get it. But here's the thing. Habits develop very quickly. And so you're right. Your child does prefer to sleep with you. In other words, that really is your child's preference. But it's not a big enough preference that it will ruin his world if he doesn't get that. And he will discover that he likes the independence of his own room in time. In other words, there will be a time and not so far from now that you couldn't get him to go to bed with you if you wanted to. In other words, Mm -hmm. there will be a time and not so far from now that you can't get him to come up into your lap and cuddle in the way that is sometimes time satisfying to you because he has no more need for that, you see. Mm -hmm. And so there are two rules of thumb. The most significant thing is you must be selfishly oriented. And it's possible for you to be selfishly oriented and care about someone else at the same time. But you can't let what they want matter more to you than what you want or you're going to get out of balance. And then that's where you start sacrificing, which then lays the groundwork for resistance and resentment. And then you find yourself in an adult relationship like so many adults who have parents and parents who have adult children and none of them even like each other because their relationship is based on sacrifice and resentment Mm -hmm. instead of upon balance and alignment and self-sufficiency. Someone who really wants to help really enjoys a needy friend sort of a nice balance. I like to help and you like to be helped and so we get along really good together. But most of you have to acknowledge that the people who make your heart sing the most are those independent, self-sufficient beings who aren't dependent upon you for their joy. In other words, when someone says to you, you need to do something so that I can feel better, If there's only one of them, you might take them in as a friend, but you get a handful of them and you've got a burdensome crowd hanging around you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have this strange fear that I I would just like to get to the root root of because I don't really know where it comes from. Um, When I'm in the dark by my, or not even by myself, but just in the dark, it's like I have this fear that something is there or, um, and it, it comes from my childhood to the point when I was little, I thought, how do people ever live alone? And I would say, express that to people and people say, well, you know, thinking I was afraid of robbers or something like that. And it wasn't that, it was something unknown. And it just, it kind of makes my skin crawl. And I'm wondering why I have this fear, where it's coming from, or how to handle it, maybe. Well, it doesn't matter so much where it got started. And trying to figure that out usually just makes it linger longer and loom larger. But it is worth acknowledging that it is an uneasiness that is based upon a feeling of lack of security Mm -hmm. and that a feeling of security is what you're reaching for instead of that. In other words, we want you to think of, rather than getting rid of the fear, of replacing the fear with a feeling of well-being. And so you say, well, under normal circumstances, I don't fear the dark. Yesterday morning, Jerry and Esther left Dallas at 3 o'clock in the morning. And Jerry was eager to get underway. They like to get in early enough here that they can relax a little bit. And they had so much happening on the other end that they got a late start from San Antonio. And so they stopped and got a good night's sleep and then left very early in the morning. And the campground that they were parked in was hard to park in in the daylight. It it was awkward and there were lots of barricades and odd angles to it. And it took some effort for them to even get into their parking place in the daylight. And so when they awakened and Jerry announced that he wanted to leave in the dark, 
Esther felt uneasiness come over her right away. And it was valid uneasiness because with that big rig, you can't see where all of the places are touching. In other words, you're wanting to watch that you're not bumping the tree up here and you're wanting Mm -hmm. to watch that you're not running over something down here. And it's 42 feet long and the car was already attached to it. And so we would say that Esther's concern was a valid concern based upon the conditions that they were in. So Jerry is out with the walkie-talkie and he is guiding Esther carefully and Esther is trusting that he can see but she knows he can't see in the dark either. (laughs) And so he guided her to come out and, and they turned, they made the calculation that it was better to go this way than that way because of what they had seen the day before and they came to a corner that logistically they just could not manage. The coach was too long, there was too much to do, and Jerry said to Esther in the walkie-talkie, stop right there, if you keep going, we're going to bump the car on this retaining wall that had been built. And Esther said, and if I try to avoid that, I'm going to hit the tree with the motor coach. And in this contraption, you cannot go backwards. In other words, it's a hitch that can only be pulled forward Mm -hmm is not encouraged to go backwards. And so Esther got out and Jerry assessed it and they concluded that if they went inch by inch that maybe they could maneuver it. And they went inch by inch and calculated what was happening with each inch and it took over an hour but they managed to get past this barricade with no problem whatsoever. But we say Esther does not have an unreasonable fear of the dark. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean there are things you can't see as well. And you've had experiences where if you are accustomed to making your decisions based upon your physical senses, and one of your physical senses is impaired as it is in the darkness, and you're trusting that physical sense above all other senses, and you find, in other words, we're wanting to say to you, we don't think that you should calculate your fear of the darkness as an irrational thing. You just can't see as well. You can't make as many clear decisions. There are unseen things. Your sense of well-being cannot be concluded as accurately in the dark as it can in the light. Now, a sense of well-being is another thing altogether. In other words, Esther did not really lose her sense of well-being. She just lost her ability to be able to calculate distance as well. You see what we're getting at? Mm -hmm. What we're attempting to do here, we're wanting to help you soothe the idea that there's something inappropriate about you in having this concern about the dark. We want you to start saying things like, well, undoubtedly I've had experiences where there were things I didn't understand or maybe things that I've heard or maybe I've heard stories. doesn't matter where I got it and it doesn't mean that it's wrong. I'm just not wanting to be there again. I'm just not wanting to feel that way. I'm wanting my sense of well-being to supersede all other senses. I'm wanting to know that my well-being exists no matter what. I'm wanting that feeling of well-being to be there. The question that you're wanting to ask yourself is, is my fear of the dark a rational decision? Do you think Esther's is? In other Mm -hmm. words, that seems pretty rational, doesn't it? And yet we would say that there is a way of compensating for all of that. In other words, she can have everything she wants. She can leave in the dark and not run over the retaining wall. In other words, she can have it all. And we wouldn't encourage her to have one experience and then to base her decision about what she will do forevermore based upon that one experience where on a day that they really wanted to make good time, they got slowed down for a whole hour, which is a whole other reason for things happening. Esther's father had an an expression, the hurrier I go, the behinder I get. And there is something vibrational about all of that. Mm-hmm. So the first thing that we would do is talk ourselves into a soothed place of saying, my fear is not irrational. In other words, I have achieved it with reason. It's just that it is now uncomfortable to me and it no longer serves me and I want to now replace it with something else. And it's much easier for you to just move on from where you are into a place where you are not afraid of the dark than it is for you to go back and figure out why you are afraid of the dark and then to go from there. Okay. 
All right. Thank you very much. Your physical senses serve you extremely well because they validate conclusions that you have made. But it's an interesting thing. You can only see what you have reasonable belief around. Everything in this time-space reality is a vibrational interpretation.